Welcome all of you to this live program called Three Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Emmanuel Gibbon from the United States. Dr. Gibbon is an orthoplasty surgeon and assistant professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He specializes in hip and knee replacement surgery and has a particular interest for evaluation and treatment of failed hip and knee orthoplasties. Dr. Gibbon completed a hip and knee replacement surgery fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota as well as a complex pediatric orthopedic surgery fellowship at the New York University, and an adult hip and knee reconstructive surgery fellowship at the University of Florida. Passionate about basic science, Dr. Gibbon also attended Stanford University for two research fellowships. Prior to these fellowships, Dr. Gibbon earned his medical degree from the University of Rouen in Normandy, France. Then he completed his residency in orthopedic surgery and earned a PhD in biomaterials, both from the University of Paris in France. Dr. Gibbon is the 2023 recipient of the prestigious John Insall Award from the Knee Society for his clinical research on knee replacements. We are also joined by Dr. Neil Shade, who is an associate professor and the chief of orthopedics at the hospital for the University of Pennsylvania. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Emmanuel Gibbon from the United States. Over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Gibbon. Uh, I work with Dr. Sheth uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Kelbull cage uh, device for acetabular reconstruction. Um, these are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to the uh, discussion and presentation this morning. Uh, first, I'm, uh, I will start by uh, the localization of the acetabular osteolysis. Uh, it was initially described by uh, Dr. Lee uh, back in 1976. Uh, it was originally described for cemented cups, and osteolysis can be located in three different zones in the acetabulum, superior, medial, and inferior, as you can see in the picture here. And then what's important, you know, in revision cases for severe acetabular osteolysis is to classify the extent of the osteolysis. And for that, there is different classifications available. Uh, they are listed here. By far, the most commonly used is the purple skin classification. Uh, I will walk you through all the different classifications briefly. Uh, again, the Paprosky uh, classification uh, is the most widely used in the world uh, clinically and for research papers as well. It relies on different uh, anatomical region in the acetabulum. First is the hip center, whether or not it's uh, uh, displaced from its original uh, localization center. And then also the status of the teardrop, the status of the ischialysis, and also whether or not the colon line is disrupted. Uh, here are the different um, pictures of uh, severity of acetabular lysis. The Gustilo classification is an older classification. It was described in 1988, uh, especially for cemented implants. It relies on the status of the acetabular walls and has four different types of severity. That classification is not used uh, anymore. The D'Antonio classification, now known as the AOS classification, has uh, five different subtypes. Uh, it is based on uh, the presence of uh, segmental deficiencies, acetabular deficiencies, and also there is a special subtype for pelvic discontinuity, which is a major uh, problem in uh, acetabular reconstruction. The gross classification, uh, also an earlier classification back in uh, 1989, not very used uh, these days. Uh, five different subtypes uh, based on contained or uncontained uh, bone defects. And also uh, type 5 is for pelvic discontinuities, which was at that time already a, a major issue. The Saleh classification, um, uh, classification that was described a little later in 2001, um, uh, five different subtypes, also based on contained or uncontained bone defects, also the status of the anterior and the posterior column, and that classification also has a specific uh, subtype for pelvic discontinuity. And last, also an older classification, Heng uh, classification. Uh, Dr. Heng is an orthoplasty surgeon in America, and uh, he described this classification uh, back in 1988 three different uh, stages of severity, minimal, moderate, and severe. 
and it is based on the status of the rim and the bed of the acetabulum. A uh, specific mention to pelvic discontinuity. Pelvic discontinuity remains uh, a major problem in uh, 2023. Although, although we have more implants, the reconstruction is technically difficult and the results are long-term or not as good as for an easier uh, and uh, revision with the less bone defects. It was initially described by Dr. D'Antonio. Now it's known as the type four AOS uh, classification. It was eventually revised by Dr. Berry at the Mayo Clinic with different subtypes in the, within the type four with the type four A with carotary bone loss, uh, the type four B with segmental bone loss and the type four C with pelvic radiation. Here you have an example of the pelvic discontinuity with the different uh, classic features, a fractured uh, collar line, a medial displacement of the inferior pelvis, and you can see also asymmetric um, obturator foramens here. These are the classic signs of pelvic discontinuity. So where is the osteolysis usually located in the acetabulum? Well, it depends on the original fixation of the primary um, procedure, primary hip replacement. If you have a cemented cup, usually the osteolysis is more severe in uh, zones one and three of the Lee. And if you are dealing with a cementless implant, then usually the osteolysis is found uh, in zone uh, two and three. Obviously, it can be anywhere, but most of the time, uh, it's in different zones based on the original fixation. Uh, when do you need to use a cage? Well, it depends on different criteria. First, the defect, and also it depends on the type of fixation that you want to use, you're planning to use for your revision. If you want to do a cemented revision, then usually a cage is needed for Paprosky type two and above defects, and usually you'll need a bone. You'll need to add additional bone grafting to void uh, to fill the the voids. If you are planning on uh, doing a cementless revision, then usually a cage is needed for Paprosky type three and above. For the Paprosky one or two, usually you can um, deal with the defect with a larger cup or a large cup and an augment and the cage is not needed because of the biology of the cementless fixation. What are the different cage options on the market? Uh, there's different ones, uh, as you'll see, obviously the cable cage that we will discuss uh, more in details in the coming slides. Then you have the Mueller ring, uh, which was designed by Dr. Mueller. It's a smaller ring with fixations uh, only superiorly. There is no fixation inferiorly. The Gans uh, device or the Gans cage is similar to the Mueller ring. It also has fixation superiorly and an additional small hook, uh, as you can see here, that you can uh, place under the teardrop in the acetabulum. And then you have the gap ring, obviously a different design here with two superior plates and multiple additional screw holes and also an inferior uh, little hook to be placed under the teardrop. And finally, the Burschneider cage, also known as the anti protrusion cage. That cage is used for the cup cage or the half cup cage uh, technique, especially for pelvic discontinuity. These are the different cage options. Uh, there may be more, but they are the most widely used. And we are going to focus on the cable cage now. Moving on to the cable cage. The cable cage was originally designed uh, by Dr. Cable, hence the name of the cage. Uh, it was first manufactured in Paris in 1974. Uh, it has a very specific shape. It's a hemisphere uh, and a cross with four arms, two vertical arms and two horizontal arms and also an inferior hook you can see here that should be placed under the teardrop. The superior flange has uh, four holes uh, to accommodate for screws to be placed in the ileum. Uh, the original cage was made of uh, 316L uh, stainless steel. Again, the superior flange uh, can accommodate iliac screws, uh, maximum four screws. The inferior hook is extremely important for the success of the reconstruction and should be placed under the teardrop uh, or the inferior margin of the acetabulum. Uh, the cage uh, comes with a 10 degree uh, underversion. That means there is right and left series. 
Uh, the cage come with six, uh, comes with six different sizes, uh, as you can see in this picture, and the outer diameters uh, range from 40 to 60 millimeters, and you can place five millimeter screws uh, on the superior flange. There's also small screw uh, holes here on the, on the horizontal arm. You can place place 3.5 millimeter screws in these uh, holes, but we, most of the time, based on my experience, we never, we never use these holes. Moving on to the surgical technique. So in revision surgery, obviously first, uh, you have to remove the prior implants for whatever reason, and it should be very careful, very delicate. Uh, you can use uh, any device you want. We used to use, we like to use this device, which is a blade that can come all around the acetabular implants. And then once the implant is out, you can use a combination of curettes and pulse lavage to remove uh, the dead tissues as well as the false membranes. It's very important to minimize reaming as you can expect the bone is very soft and the entire wall, the posterior wall and the medial wall as well. So you don't want to perforate, but if you want to ream, I would suggest you, you ream very slowly and in reverse. And then once you are happy with the debridement, you can move on to the next step, uh, which is the cable cage positioning. For that stage uh, and that step, it's, it's important to use a trial first. So you place the trial uh, under the teardrop, as you can see here in this picture on the left. And then once the trial is in, you can evaluate and assess the severity of the bone defects and what kind of uh, bone graft you'll need to use. By design, when you place the cable cage under the, under the teardrop, as you can see in that picture in the middle, you will have a 40 to 45 uh, degrees abduction angle, uh, angle, which is adequate for reconstruction. But again, that can be achieved only if you place the inferior hook under the teardrop. And then I, I would suggest you don't bend the arms or the flange, uh, so then you don't change the abduction angle and also you you can mitigate uh, breakage or fracture of the cage uh, following uh, bending. And then the next step is bone grafting, obviously extremely important in that technique. So after placing the trial, you approximately know uh, what kind of graft you'll need. Uh, and reconstruction starts with the acetabular roof. Uh, usually it's a major defect and you'll need a bulky allograft, which is taken from a fresh frozen uh, formal head. And you need to use a combination of uh, saw, small, sag small sagittal saw, and small adjustments with the ranger in order to perfectly fit uh, the yellow graft uh, on the rooftop. And then once the graft is placed, uh, you can take the final uh, cage, place it under the teardrop. If the teardrop is damaged, it's also important to reconstruct the teardrop first with an yellow graft. And then once you have a strong, reliable teardrop, either the native teardrop and a, or reconstructed teardrop, you can place the cage right under the teardrop, applicate, you can, you can place the teardrop against the superior uh, bulky graft, and then you can start placing the, the screws. Again, here's a picture of, uh, you can see a reconstructed teardrop here with a piece of uh, bone arrow graft in the teardrop, and then the cage is applied. Uh, on the superior uh, bulky yellow graft, and you can start securing the plate with screws. These are five millimeter screws, and you should start by placing the inferior, the most inferior screw first through the cage, through the yellow graft into the ilium. I would suggest you place at least another screw, three screws or better, but sometimes it's not possible, so at least two screws. And once you are done with the with all your screws, I would suggest you tighten them again one by one in order to achieve excellent stability. And then the last step is uh, of the reconstruction is placing additional bone graft. Uh, I would suggest you use bulk aloe graft as well because they provide more support. So you can reconstruct the posterior wall, the entire wall, and then inevitably there will be additional small uh, bone defects and you can use either bone chips or muscleized uh, aloe graft, and you fill all the cavities. All the cavities must be completely filled uh, at the end of that step. 
And then this is an example of final construct. You have the trial allograft here. You can assess the severity of the osteolysis. You placed your bulky allograft on top. The teardrop is reconstructed with a small piece of bone allograft here. The screws are placed in the cage, in the allograft, and then through the ileum. And this is a lateral view of the reconstruction. You can see the extent of the bone graft. That can be uh, pretty significant, and therefore you'll need screws. Sometimes the screws can be as long as 70 or 80 millimeters. And then uh, once you're happy with the primary fixation, you can move on to the implant of your choice. Obviously, it's going to be a cemented fixation, uh, and you can uh, cement uh, an all poly liner, or you can cement a dual mobility implant, or even a constraint liner if you want. This is an example of a patient uh, with a type uh, 2 Paprosky acetal rear defect of his uh, right hip. He underwent a both component revision by Dr. Hamadouche uh, in Paris through a transtrochanteric approach, and the acetabular reconstruction was performed using a cable cage, allograft, two screws uh, proximally, and Dr. Hamadouche cemented an all poly liner inside the cage, as you can see here uh, for the right hip. Clinical outcomes of the Kerbal cage. As any, you know, reconstructive or technique in orthopedic surgery, uh, we need data to make sure uh, it works and provide uh, excellent outcomes for patients. This is uh, the original uh, study out of Paris uh, from Dr. Kerbal and uh, father and son, uh, and as well as Dr. Hamadouche. It's a retrospective study, uh, 60 patients. The mean age was 58. And the mean follow-up was eight years. Uh, bone defects were classified as AOS type three and four, including some uh, pelvic discontinuities. And the authors, they demonstrated 92% survivorship free from acetabular loosening. Here is another uh, study out of Japan. Uh, in Japan, they use a Kerbal type acetabular reinforcement device, which is very similar to the original Kerbal cage. It's made of titanium. Uh, it's uh, that study is a retrospective study made um, made with a design with 37 patients. The mean age was 66, and the mean follow-up was was 13 years. Bone defects were not as bad as the prior study. They were classified as AOS type two and three. There was no pelvic discontinuity in that study, and the authors also demonstrated excellent survivorship at 13 years follow-up with 95% uh, free from acetabular loosening. Last uh, more recent study in uh, 2018 uh, from myself and the team in Paris, uh, we looked at the outcomes of uh, reconstruction with the Kerbal cage, specifically when the teardrop was damaged. So it was a retrospective study, 36 patients, the mean age was 65, and the mean follow-up was eight years. Again, we looked at severe Paprosky type 3 acetabular defects, and all patients had a deficient or damaged teardrop. Clinically, we demonstrated 95% survivorship free from, free from acetabular loosening at eight years follow-up. However, looking at the, the outcomes and the survivorship free from radiographic loosening, it was significantly inferior at 77%. And here you can see a failure of the reconstruction. This is the original uh, X-ray. This is actually a revision of a revision. You can see how damaged the teardrop is in, in the superior picture. On the bottom right, you can see the failure of the uh, reconstruction with a, a completely displaced um, Kerbal cage. A new design was made um, a few years ago with Dr. Hamadouche in a partnership with Medacta. Uh, the new cage is made of titanium. It roughly comes in the same size, same design as well. The major improvements are increased fatigue resistance as well as increased thickness from 2 to 2.5 millimeters. There's no holes anymore in the horizontal arms here. Uh, also, the outside is uh, has a sandblasted finish in order to promote uh, also integration. And the inferior hook, as you can see here, is slightly wider in order to provide better stability uh, under the teardrop. Therefore, in conclusion, the Kerbal cage is a reliable device for severe acetabular defect reconstruction. 
you should always have bone graft available in the operating room as I would say close to 100% of the time you'll need some. The best results are achieved with an intact teardrop and therefore you should be cautious when the teardrop is uh, deficient as most of the time it needs reconstruction first in order to achieve primary stability. And again, if you cannot achieve or obtain uh, primary stability most of the time because of the deficient teardrop, then you should have a plan B and use a different uh, method for the acetabular reconstruction. Thank you very much for your attention. And if I have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you can stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, Emmanuel, for this brilliant presentation and congratulations for all the papers that you've written. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having us this morning. Yeah, uh, let's have a short Q&A. Now, Emmanuel, you mentioned about bulk as well as morselized graft, right? So right. which is better? Is there any data to say that, okay, bulk allograft is better than a morselized graft? For this specific technique? Yes. Uh, I'm not aware of any study, but uh, mechanically, it makes sense to use a, a bulk allograft, especially for the roof. You know, most of the time, you know, severe defect, they have a... They have a superior migration of the um, of the implant, and if you want a good screw purchase, uh, especially through the plate and towards the acetabulum, if you have morselized bone graft uh, on the on the top of the acetabulum over the roof, you won't have a good purchase and a good primary fixation. So mechanically, it makes more sense to use a bulk allograft graft superiorly, but there is no data supporting. Uh, that uh, against uh, versus, you know, morselized allograft. But again, it makes sense mechanically to have a, a big piece of allogram superior, of allograft superiorly. Thank you, Emmanuel. And also, what is the role for addition of a demineralized bone matrix, DBM? I, I just saw that Hamadusha also wrote a paper in 2011 on the role of DBM for heal, uh, union, improved union weights. Well, uh, that can be useful in uh, pelvic discontinuities or uh, sometimes if you want to feel like smaller voids. Uh, personally, I like using um, bone allograft because it's it's more biologically biologically sound. And but um, I don't think there is like superior uh, results, especially for the the cable cage uh, when you use DBM. So you can use DBM if you want in in combination with the uh, allograft. And Emmanuel, now there's a lot of interest with modular augments, right? A lot of people use augments. So do you think augments with a standard hemispherical cup is a good alternative instead of a cage, cup cage construct? So, you know, usually when you use an augment, it's a highly porous uh, surface. And, and uh, obviously you have the augment and then you have the cage. And, and the way we unite, we unite the augment and the cage is with cement between these two implants. So if you use an augment, instead of using allograft, obviously the augment will have to be screwed in, you know, but there will be no, no, the, the augment will not be united with the cage because the cage is not porous itself. So it, it, there won't be any like good primary stability between the augment and the cage, like you have with cement between an augment and the cage. So I would not recommend using an augment with the, the Kerbal cage. It, it, it will, I, I think it will fail um, fast. Just one last question uh, to Emmanuel as well as Neil. Neil, there are so many options like cup cage, the Gans cage, the Burr Schneider cage, the Kerbal cage, the anti protrusion cage, the oblong cage. So many options, right? So, what is the? How do you go about using the best cage in your clinical practice, Neil? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, this is actually one of my questions for Emmanuel. Emmanuel, great talk and a great review of you know of a complex topic. But this kind of brings me to the question I have: is you know, I. You're right. There's, there's a lot of options out there. And I think right. that you have to really think about what option you're using for a specific individual case or an individual patient. I think there's different uh, uh, different markets out there where one option may be better. Uh, I mean, Hitesh, where you work, like in India for certain, uh, for example, there are definitely patients who cannot afford cementless, porous uh, coated implants. And as a result, cages and cement and allograft may be a cheaper, more economical option. And you guys are very, very good at using allograft and being able to reconstruct big defects. We're not as good in the United States. 
you know, Emmanuel, you trained with with Musa, and again in in France, like in, in Europe, like again, a lot of experience with cementing and a lot of experience with using allograft, uh, and I think those things work very very well. You know, my my question and sort of a part of your uh, part of the answer to your question, um, Hitesh, is, Emmanuel, you, I'm assuming you have migrated from using the Kerbal cage routinely as your choice option for a chronic pelvic discontinuity. What are you looking at using now? And I think the, the reason I'm asking this is, Hitesh, I think the whole world has moved towards cementless fixation if they can get it because of the chance of getting biologic fixation and improving implant longevity. But Emmanuel, what's your what's your uh, treatment of choice now? Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, great question. Uh, so right now, uh, as I as I work in North America, um, I'm using cementless technology, especially larger, highly porous cups and augments. And I think I think the main advantage of that technique is you can you can use more screws. You know, when you use the the cable cage and an allograft, you know, you don't have much screw holes. You know, you won't have like great purchase in in the acetabulum. So when you use a, a cementless highly porous especially uh, TM cup, you can you can drill through it and through the augments as well. And you can have additional screws and excellent uh, primary stability uh, in the implant. Also, I think you have a better coverage, you know, with the implant. So the biology is also improved with uh, cementless technology. And when you use a bulk allograft, you're always worried about resorption that you don't have with the cementless technology. So... These days, you know, when I do a complex revision, I use uh, usually a large uh, cup, sometimes a jumbo cup, uh, and I try to use augments as, as much as I can, but I moved away from uh, uh, cement for my uh, reconstruction. Obviously, when I use a, a complete like TM cup, I will have to cement an implant into it, uh, but otherwise, if I can use a highly porous cup and then I can, uh, you know, uh, put like a, a liner into it without um, cement. That's my uh, technique of choice. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Emmanuel. You know, and I think that, you know, what I was, uh, and again, a great job on putting this chapter together for our textbook on the treatment of chronic, uh, of acetabular bone loss and chronic pelvic discontinuity. But look, you know, looking at the technique that you even just described, I would imagine it's very technically demanding to get the hook in the right spot inferiorly based on how much of a teardrop you have left, even if your teardrop is completely intact, the rotation of your device can change slightly based on where you put that hook. And then depending on the size of your bulk allograft, have you fashioned it properly to sit exactly where it needs to sit? Because that will change the angle of the Kerbal device. And now, like you said, you only have three or four screw hole options in that side plate. And if That's you're it. off angle, you're getting shorter screws, less working length, and I know the goal is to try to get these nice long 70, 80 millimeter screws into the sacral buttress, right, or sciatic buttress to get the best fixation of the remaining of bone, bone that you have left. But that's hard to do. I mean, it's it's asking for a lot of things to line up perfectly to get that screw. Right. right? Absolutely. And so I think one of the things with, with cementless devices now, I think you have a better option and better ability to intraoperatively unitize your construct of whatever you create but intraoperatively customize the contract that you need for that specific patient. That's very true. And also, you know, sometimes it's, it's an issue. You do a revision in a, in a smaller patient, a female, you use a small cage and your options for the, the, the femoral head size uh, is limited and there is increased risk of instability as well. So when you use a, a cementless technology, you can accommodate a much bigger uh, femoral head and then um uh, improve uh, stability, uh, right? And uh, Neil yeah. and Emmanuel, now since most of you guys are doing more cementless porous coated implants compared to the cemented ones, you need something to hold that, right? The superior and inferior parts. The Kerbal cage has an advantage, holds it together. So I, so you you add a plate or something like we mentioned before, Kerbal plate or was it, what is it called? You mean for... for when, Sorry, you're using ahead, a when you're using a cementless implant, still you have a you're using augments, right? To support it. Okay, so to hold those two things, because in the cage you have a hook there to hold the upper and the lower part. So do you add a plate or something to hold those? Yeah, no, I, I see what you mean. So when you when you do a cementless revision with a highly porous cup and a highly porous augments, 
uh, there's there's different ways to do it. You can you can put the the cup first and, or the augment first. Anyway, they will be uni united together with cement, and we you don't need a plate or a cage when you do that. And, and usually, when we use a plate or a cage in uh, cementless technology, it's when we are dealing with pelvic discontinuity, and it's the cup cage construct. And but you put the the cage first, so you can have the biology of the highly porous cementless implant with ingrowth, you know, into the into the implant, and then on top or inside the the cup, you're gonna put the cage. So it's it's the cup first, and then the cage. But this the half it's called the cup cage, the half cup cage technique, and it's it's most most of the time reserved only for pelvic discontinuities. But okay. most so of the time, you it will the be the cage. yeah, the type four A O S. A pelvic discontinuity, right? Yes. Yes. And here, Tash, one additional comment. You know, I think in the setting of a chronic pelvic discontinuity, you don't want to plate those because the biology of the discontinuity is not is variable. And you're not going to get compression across it with a plate to get healing. And the, the Mayo group has shown that those don't do well. They do great for acute pelvic discontinuities, but that's because the biology is maintained. You know, again, uh, from my institution here, and as well as from the Rush Institution, like, you know, we're big fans of using Astaber distraction technique, yeah, where I think what that. that will do is that will give you lateral or peripheral distraction of the acetabulum, will result in medial or central compression across the discontinuity. And what that does is when you're putting in your cups and augments and your reconstruction, when you take the distractor off, the elastic recoil of the pelvis is what keeps those implants in place. So assuming you have sized it appropriately, you have put them in the right position, the elastic recoil is what will come back and hold those components in position. And again, while holding that pelvis in a position where it can allow for compression and, and healing across the discontinuity. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you for this brilliant presentation and really look forward for more from your side, Neil. Anytime. Great. Thank you. Very thank much. you so much. Yeah. Man, bye -bye. Great job this morning. And Hitesh, thank you again for the opportunity to be with you this morning. Hopefully to see you next month. Bye-bye.